Hello again. This month I've been making a commission for a friend, so it's about time for another video. This time, however, I've decided to try having some more tutorial style sections in these longer workflow or logbook type videos detailing some of the techniques used in more detail. Let me know what you think about that. For this project, I was tasked with creating a Norse style fur lined coat for a Viking character intended to be worn for the Viking Lab bind rune. As a bonus, while it isn't for Empire Lab specifically, it could totally be reused for the Rus inspired nation of Vrushka as well. We based the design on a couple of examples and decided on this gorgeous green 100% wool fabric from Textile Express and a lovely gingery brown faux fur to go with that. As with my previous two coats, the pattern is based on extant examples of Norse coats and tunics but it isn't at all meant to be historically accurate, so much as it's meant to invoke the look and feel of the somewhat fantastical viking figure. If you've seen my other two videos, you've seen this patterning method before. It's comprised entirely of rectangles and triangles, so I mapped out the pattern on scaled grid paper then transferred that to the wool by hand. I do actually do other pattern methods too, I promise. Once the wool was cut, I laid those down on the back of the fur and cut around them, being careful to clip through the backing only, trying to cut as little of the actual fur as possible. With real fur, it's pretty easy as you can cut the hide with a blade, but with this particular faux fur, the backing completely resisted being cut with a craft knife, so scissors it is. And once that's done, it's time to put it together. I start the process by sewing the triangular side gauze onto the front and back panels of the coat. With these sorts of triangular gauze, the side of the triangle that's cut on the bias should be sewn to the straight edge of the body, so that the side seam, where the two triangles meet, is also on the straight grain. This prevents the bias edge from warping and stretching over time, which would end up looking bad and potentially cause the hem to become uneven. After the side panels, I put in the centre back gore. This is another triangular panel that in this case gets sewn into a slit. However, these gores can also be sewn into a centre back seam. The gore should be slightly longer than the slit, giving a little seam allowance at the top corner of the triangle. It first gets pinned to one side of the slit, as you can see me doing here. When sewing these gores, the seam allowance is not an even size throughout. Instead, you should taper your stitch line closer to the edge as you get to the top of the gore, as you will see in a moment. Ideally, you should end your machine stitching a few centimetres from the top and finish it by hand as this is far easier and more precise. Yes, past me, who tried to do it all by machine and had to unpick it off camera, I'm talking to you. Anyway, when you've done the first side, before you press the seam open or to the side, whatever is your preference here, you should flip the gore inside and match it up very carefully to the other side of the slit, as you can see me doing here, and then sew it as you previously did. More on that hand sewing part later though. The 
next up, I align the shoulders to the front and back panels, pin them and sew across both at the same time. To reduce some bulk, I press the seam allowances open here. As this pattern has no set in armhole, the sleeves are pretty easy to attach. I folded them in half and marked the centre point off screen. This is then matched to the shoulder seam and the full thing is then pinned. This coat, as many historical patterns do, has square underarm gussets. As such, I needed to sew the sleeves on in a particular way. This is only one method, the sleeves can be fully made up with their gussets and then sewn in, but I like doing it this way. I marked on some seam allowances with chalk and then, as you will see in a moment, only sewed between the two markings, leaving an unsewed 2cm seam allowance at each end. This enables you to properly insert the underarm gusset and also prevents any weird pulling or wrinkling at the seams. To insert a square gusset with this method, you should mark seam allowances on your gusset and then match up one of the corners with the end of the seam you just sewed, as you can see me doing here. Pin one side of the gusset to the sleeve as shown and then sew it between the two marked corners, once again leaving the 2cm allowance loose at either end. You're then going to grab the gusset and pivot it at the corner you started at and attach the next side to the body panel in the same way. Why go to all this trouble? Well, the underarm gussets form the bottom of an armhole, giving you more space to move your arm. They're pretty essential in lots of historical clothing, especially those that fit closer to your body, though not all of them are square. At this point the gusset can look a little strange. The easiest way I can demonstrate how to attach the last two sides of the square is to lay the coat out and fold it over at the shoulder. The free corner of the square is the one that matches up with the right angle created by the sleeve and the body of the coat. Pin and sew them exactly as before and then you have a nice clean underarm gusset all done. You can then finish the sleeve seam and the side seam sewing right up to the corner of the gusset seams to avoid any holes. And now it's time to make the lining. I do this exactly the same way I made up the coat outer, but it's fur. Fur, fake or real, is somewhat its own beast, not really acting like any other material due to how thick it is. To help me control it a little, I'm using these Clover brand two prong fork pins to prevent it from moving around, and I'm tucking as much of the fur as I can inwards as I go to help me match up the edges. The centre back gore is sewn in exactly the same way as before, only this time I didn't try to do it all by machine. I stopped a couple of centimetres from the top on both sides, then finished it off by hand, as you will see in just a moment. It really is so much easier to get a nice crisp finish to the top of a gore by hand, as you can control exactly where the stitches go, even very very close to the edge as they have to be to get a nice sharp point in a slit like this. I did end up doing this on the outer wall as well, but I neglected to film that. Basically you just want to create a nice strong back stitch, catching in the edge of the slit as much as you can. Mine admittedly wasn't wonderfully done on the lining, but you can't see it from the right side of the fur. The wool was far better behaved.
one thing you should do with fur is shave down the fur in the seam allowances. This helps reduce bulk, especially where seams cross other seams, such as on the hem. I shaved off the main seams after they were sewed together, as you can see here, but for pieces where I needed a little more precision, such as the square underarm gussets, I shaved them before sewing. This helped me match up the edges, as you will see. The lining sleeves and their matching underarm gussets go in exactly the same way as the ones in the outer fabric. It's exactly the same process, so I won't repeat myself. Next, I sew together the fur trim sections. The separate sections are for the neck, which is made of three pieces, the hem, which is made of four, the cuffs, which are one piece each, and both front edges, which I had to piece together to create a long strip from two pieces each. All around the coat, I have drawn a guideline of chalk where I will attach the trim, then fold it down to meet the edge of the coat, enclosing the raw edge. I started with the cuffs as they were the smallest piece, but they also turned out to be the hardest. Here you can see me matching the edge of the trim up with my guideline and pinning it in place with those fork pins from earlier. I ended up basting these on with some white tacking thread off camera when I realised the error of my ways. That is, the cuff was too small to fit over the shank of my sewing machine, so I had to turn the sleeves inside out and very carefully sew around them inside out. I had to sew a couple of centimetres at a time, then move the fabric around so I could sew the next section. If I'd left pins in here, there definitely would have been an injury. The hem, neck and front edges of the trim were a lot easier to sew. Much like the sleeves and gussets, I only sewed to corners where the guidelines intersected so I could create nice sharp corners in the trim. However, at the bottom of the front edges, I overlapped the front trim with the hem trim and created a straight seam there as you'll see. I cut the excess from the hem section to help everything lay flat as well.
get the fur to line nicely without an obvious seam at the neck, I made a sort of mitered corner. That is, a diagonal seam between the inner and outer corners of the trim. You can see me matching up the fur around the neck and the front opening, pinning it with the two prong pins from earlier and marking on the diagonal. As you can see, the right side ends up looking nice and neat. And now it's finally time to put it together. As with the coat from the previous video, I'm going to be doing the bagging out method to attach both layers to one another, with a few little tweaks since I'm dealing with thick heavy fur this time. But first, given that there's so much thick fabric here, it's time to bring out the big guns. Or rather, a walking foot. This foot has feed dogs inside of it, and a mechanism that works with the sewing machine movement, which helps to guide fabric through the machine from above as well as below. Works great for thick fabrics and sticky materials like leather and PVC as well. I first attached the front edges of lining and outer, then spent some time puzzling over the sleeves. I completely failed to record any of my ponderings, but then this video is already long enough. So I'll cover how to deal with sleeves when bagging our lining in a later video. After that, I sewed up the neck and then finally the hem, shaving down seam allowances as I went. When you do line a garment this way though, you must always leave a big enough opening on the hem through which to tear the entire garment right side out. Once it's all right side out and all the edges are pressed, you can then close the hem. I marked the 2cm seam allowance here with my handy seam gauge and a chalk pencil and then folded the seam allowance under and pinned it. To help me fold it, I rest my finger against the chalk line, giving me a more tangible point to fold over, given that I'm hiding the chalk marks from myself every time I fold it. If this wasn't fur, I would consider thread marking the seam line so I could see from the outside, just for accuracy. But I wouldn't be able to see it properly through the fur, so there's no point. Finally, I used a ladder stitch to close the opening. With a ladder stitch, you bring your needle through one edge of the opening, travelling along the fold, then take it straight across and bring it through the other. You do this for a few stitches, creating a bladder with the thread, hence the name, and then pull the thread to close the stitches and the opening. Finally, it's time to make some toggles to close the coat with. I went through a few variations before I settled on making them from the wool, including testing some brown suede and leathers I had, but ultimately I went with this as it ended up being the cleanest looking. I cut 2cm strips from the wool fabric, then folded the raw edges in and pressed them. The fabric just wouldn't stay on its own, so I used little strips of heat and bond, an iron-on adhesive backing used for, for applique and other similar embellishments to hold them down, as you won't see the backs anywhere. I then rolled half of them up and threaded them through some wooden toggles. The other half would create the loops. Here, you can see me marking them all out and trimming them to the correct lengths, and pinning them ready to sew them up. Once the toggles and their loops were all measured and marked, I sewed the two halves of the strips together with a ladder stitch as this would be invisible from the outside and would allow them to lay completely flat. On the backs of the loop parts, I did do some quick whip stitches just to help hold the edges in place. Each 
toggle and loop was then carefully positioned and top stitched over the fur trim. The walking foot would have been really helpful here, as this was so difficult to get through my machine, but as I needed to sew very precisely close to the edge, I decided that the walking foot just didn't let me see clearly enough. I managed. I highly recommend basting or otherwise adhering toggles like this down before sewing so they don't move around. Finally, I hand sewed the edges of the toggles down neatly. I left long tails of thread when I did the top stitching so I could give each one a nice neat finish. And at long last, here it is. This project took just shy of 10 hours real time to build and I think the result was worth it. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed this more instructional format. See you next time. Are you helping? Hmm? Are you helping? How am I supposed to get any work done with you around?